Well, good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'm very happy to welcome Niels Schmidt. He's been a member of the German Bundestag since September of 2017, and he serves on the Foreign Affairs Committee and has been the foreign policy spokesperson for the Social Democrats in the Bundestag. Before entering the Bundestag, he was a member of the Landtag in Baden-Württemberg, and from 2009 to 2016, he was chairman of the SPD at the state level. From 2011 to 2016, he was Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs in the state of Baden-Württemberg, as well as the Deputy Minister President. Niels, herzlich willkommen. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I'm very happy to, to see you today. Um, as uh, our viewers don't know, you and I had the opportunity to, to meet a few weeks ago in, in Philadelphia and, and start a conversation about, um, about foreign affairs and the state of the world. Uh, and I said to you at that time, um, we'd love to have you in person. And until more in-person meetings are possible, let's try to set up a, a Zoom meeting and um, one of the catalysts for setting up today's uh, conversation was that in July, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation published an article that you wrote calling for greater cooperation between Europe and the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. And um, I thought we would spend you know, the hour that we have today talking about China, and we will get to China. But in light of the recent developments in Afghanistan, I, I feel as though we have to start the conversation there. Um, Niels, I think for all of us uh, on the outside, watching the situation in Afghanistan is, is very, very difficult. But I can imagine that it must be particularly difficult uh, for Germany. As I think back um, about Germany's involvement in Afghanistan, um, it was already uh, under Chancellor Gerhard Schröder in the weeks and days following the 9-11 attacks that Germany declared its support of the mission in Afghanistan. Germany sent troops there in the first major deployment of German soldiers since World War II. And over the years, Germany has invested billions of dollars in Afghanistan and has taken in thousands of, of refugees. And yet it's always been a controversial subject, um, but each successive German government remained committed to the operation in Afghanistan. And now that's come to an end and the situation in Afghanistan has become um, very difficult uh, in, indeed with the takeover um, of the Taliban. And so, Niels, I guess, you know, why don't we sort of start by hearing your take uh, on the unfolding situation in, in Afghanistan right now? Well, uh, Stephen, for us in Germany, it's heartbreaking to see all these people fleeing to the airport, uh, trying to leave the country. Um, we feel after 20 years of involvement um, that somehow we failed them. On the other hand, I do not want to turn to negative uh, on, on this uh, mission um, because for 20 years, German forces along with other NATO forces have maintained some kind of stability, has opened up many opportunities uh, for the people living in Afghanistan, especially uh, for women and children. So not everything uh, is lost. And um, we have seen coming up a generation of Afghan um, men and women who have experienced some kind of uh, freedom, personal freedom, uh, have uh, seen uh, education opportunities opening up for them. Uh, so we should not let this traumatic end uh, of uh, this mission overshadow uh, all uh, what we have achieved there. Still, um, it has been a very serious miscalculation from all Western powers uh, after the announcement of the um, uh, troop uh, withdrawal. And there's a lot to be in inquired um, by parliament, uh, by media, uh, on how we could be de uh, deceived um, uh, and deluded to such an extent by uh, the strength or uh, weakness of the Afghan uh, military forces. 
But now the most important thing is to get as many people out as we can, not only our own citizen, uh, citizens, but also uh, our partners, interpreters, uh, civil society activists, activists, and all those who are now threatened by the Taliban. Thank you, Niels. Um, let me pick up on just a couple of the points that, that you just raised. Um, you know, I think, I think you make a, a very important point when you say that, that we shouldn't necessarily let um, this dramatic end and tumultuous end um, completely overshadow the good work that was done over the course of 20 years. Um, but I guess the, the big common concern that many of us have is how much of that work will last um, under, under this new environment that we're looking at. Um, obviously, there were some advances that were made. Um, you talked about a new generation of people who have experienced freedom and, and been able to get an education. Um, but if those developments are turned around, um, it's, it's a very sad narrative indeed. Yes, you're right. And with many thousands of those who have uh, built up these networks of civil society and free media leaving the country, um, there is this feeling of um, lost hopes and abandonment. And uh, for us in Germany, this is especially sad because uh, sending uh, German forces to Afghanistan was the first major um, foreign assignment uh, for our Bundeswehr, for our federal forces. Um, and it is the most, uh, uh, the longest um, military mission abroad uh, Germany has experienced so far after World War II. And um, so uh, Afghanistan has really a sort of pivotal role as uh, far as uh, foreign missions uh, of the uh, German armed forces are concerned. And especially training missions will be under more scrutiny now, uh, since uh, we have seen a, a sort of facade of um, armed forces being trained and equipped, but not uh, standing on the ground against uh, insurgency uh, uh, forces like the Taliban. And uh, we, we are, together with American forces, by the way, training the Iraqi government forces now. And we have a European training mission in Mali, in West Africa. So now there are uh, some doubts about the effectis effectiveness of this kind of training missions. So what we, what we are seeing in, in Afghanistan, Afghanistan has tremendous uh, consequences for German foreign policy and I guess for Western foreign uh, policy in general. And that, that leads sort of to another point that you brought up in your, in your opening statement um, about the serious miscalculation in terms of the strength of the Taliban um, at this time. Um, I think um, many observers thought that the, the Taliban could come back um, in some parts of Afghanistan, but nobody imagined that they would be back in the capital uh, as quickly as they were and that the, the cities would fall as quickly as they did um, and that the, the Afghan military would not stand up to them. Um, in some of the analysis that I've heard with, with US military leaders who were involved in some of the training, um, they commented that the, the Afghan army was trained um, more in the model of the U.S. military or a Western military and not in the model of um, the, the kind of force they would be opposing um, and that that might have been a mistake. Um, but I guess I'd like to draw you out on, on sort of how um, the, the West, um, how the U.S., how Germany with boots on the ground um, could have made such a serious miscalculation in terms of um, the speed with which the Taliban would, would take the country over again? Well, to me, it has become clear over the last few days uh, since we've had uh, special sessions in, in, in the Bundestag on, on, on committee level um, that our intelligence uh, services have failed. 
So only one week ago, last Friday, our intelligence uh, services uh, told us that Kabul uh, will not fall soon. Uh, two days later, it was all over. So uh, we have, um, uh, there's uh, now widespread uh, skepticism about uh, the capabilities uh, of, of our intelligence, intelligence community. And this is not something exclusive to Germany, it seems to me, because there's a sharing of uh, data and information uh, among Western powers, among Western intelligence, intelligence agencies. So we have to really um, uh, focus on uh, what uh, failures led us to this uh, uh, failure in assessing uh, the situation on, on the ground after 20 years of presence, you have to keep in mind that. Um, but still, uh, there might be an even uh, deeper uh, root uh, for this uh, miscalculation. And that is the fact, not so much that uh, we didn't uh, have the adequate training methods, but maybe we underestimated to which extent loyalty to the central government uh, uh, was weak in Afghanistan. Uh, well, central government has always been quite weak in this uh, country, it seems to me. Um, still, we too long uh, believed, and this is also wishful thinking, I, I, uh, I, I believe, uh, we, uh, we were convinced that the central government would uh, have some loyalty, find some loyalty among the Afghan people, but due to incompetence and corruption, um, even many soldiers uh, did not really want to fight uh, for, this, um, for this government. And it seems that withdrawing not only troops, but also contractors um, played also a role. I think this has also been uh, much debated in the US because many of these contractors were uh, from the US. So our withdrawal was not well prepared. It was not really conditions-based. Uh, it was more uh, based on the timeline for understandable reasons. So I'm, I'm not one of those who just want to criticize President Biden for his decision, but still it was ill-prepared. And, and now we, we see uh, the, the consequences of it. So, I mean, I think that the, you know, there are lots of questions around the timing of the withdrawal um, and the way in which that was, was implemented. Um, now, of course, there's a, a crisis situation, and you touched on this a little bit earlier, um, of trying to help people get out of Afghanistan, and that includes, obviously, citizens, um, as well as uh, those Afghans who have helped the West, whether it's been as interpreters, um, but also journalists, uh, fixers, uh, who, who helped those journalists and helped the, the military. Can you um, maybe talk a little bit about what Germany is doing to try to help rescue people in Afghanistan right now? We are doing more or less the same thing as the US uh, is doing. Um, and there's always a, uh, a discrepancy in, in dimension. And so there are much more US military forces on the ground in, uh, at Kabul airport than uh, German military forces. But we also brought in um, specialized forces uh, to secure uh, the military airport in, in Kabul and to uh, clean the runways and to uh, enable uh, uh, planes uh, coming in and departing again. Uh, we have lists of people who, uh, who want to be um, uh, uh, flown out. Uh, one is uh, our own citizens. And the second is uh, partners, uh, contractors, uh, staff, uh, which, uh, who, has, who have ties to uh, German uh, civil uh, organizations or governmental agencies in terms of um, development aid. Or, and the uh, third group is activists uh, who are under threat from the Taliban and who need um, protection and who must uh, uh, be uh, flown out immediately. Um, and uh, there has been a very generous offer from the German government uh, to have them uh, uh, accepted on German soil. 
currently, we are estimating that um, around um, 10,000 uh, people might be on, on lists of the German government. Um, many of the military partner, partners of German military have already been flown out before uh, the, the fall of the Afghan government via regular or charter flights uh, that was uh, uh, possible. And now when it comes to civil society and development aid organizations, we face a tremendous challenge because for many weeks, we urged them to stay on the ground because the German government, our uh, development organizations wanted to continue their work on the ground in Afghanistan, be it humanitarian aid, because we have uh, some food shortage, we have we have seen fraud in, in Afghanistan, but also uh, to continue um, to implement uh, development uh, projects all over Afghanistan, because our experts um, hoped to be able to continue at least part of their projects, even with Taliban being part of a national unity government or being part of the political uh, scene in, in, in Kabul itself. And this has completely changed because of the crack, crackdown of the, of the government. And now all these local partners want to get, uh, get out of, of the country. And now we have to, uh, to um, organize this kind of airlift, which is well mm -hmm. known to Germans, of course, because of the Berlin airlift. And, um, but there will be a, a downside uh, to, to this airlift. Um, our network of local partners will be weakened, at least for the, uh, for the short term. So uh, if we want to continue to uh, give some um, aid for development inside the country, we will not have so many uh, partners left. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not know to which extent uh, this kind of development aid and support will be possible with the Taliban in uh, running the show there now. But still, um, the middle to long term effect of uh, pulling out all these people uh, might be a negative in terms of um, opportunities and networks we have on the ground in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Um, the, the chairman of the, the Foreign Relations Committee, Norbert Röttgen, um, said, was quoted as saying that um, the current situation does, fundam quote, fundamental damage to the political and moral credibility of the West, end quote. And others have commented um, that this evolving situation in Afghanistan has really damaged American credibility abroad um, with a view to some of the other challenges um, that are on the, the transatlantic agenda. To what degree um, do you agree with um, Norbert Röttgen's comment that this damages the political and moral credibility of the West as a whole? And how do you view the credibility of the United States? No doubt there has been damage done uh, to the credibility and the image of the West. Still, we should not overestimate it under the direct impression of the uh, images we are just now receiving uh, out of Kabul. Um, it was clear, it has been clear for many years that the, that the US government will end some will somehow end its presence in Afghanistan. And in contrary to many other places in the world, leaving Afghanistan does not automatically increase the dominance or power of another big player in the world arena. So of course, Russia, China have their interests and especially China is keen uh, on investing into infrastructure projects, is keen to 
extract uh, some raw materials, um, lithium, it seems, copper, and so on uh, from this country. Uh, but in, in geopolitical terms, it's difficult to see that this will change so much uh, uh, in terms of big power competition. Or, or, uh, what I fear more is a sort of uh, downsliding of the country into chaos, as we see um, into, into civil war, war chaos, as we have seen over the last seven to eight years in Yemen. So it's more about regional powers uh, leading uh, uh, proxy wars uh, in, in Afghanistan uh, getting more involved and the international community and uh, trade powers uh, standing idly by and maybe sending some humanitarian aid into the country. Uh, this is a, a, will have terrible consequences uh, for the population in, in Afghanistan. And I think this is the the more acute danger uh, uh, for, for, for the people in Afghanistan than a loss um, for the West in a sort of big power competition with other uh, countries like uh, China or Russia. Maybe a little um, later in our conversation, we can come back to, to that point um, of, of China and Russia, perhaps filling a vacuum in Afghanistan um, or, or elsewhere, but I was interested to, to hear your thoughts about um, American credibility, credibility of the West, um, but also this notion of the international community standing by um, and watching some of this happen. Because um, in your article on China, you talked a little bit about um, the importance of President Biden's trip to Europe and his recommitment to working with allies and that his visit actually sent a strong message um, of the West's unity to the rest of the world. Um, on some levels, one might say that that was June and now in August, um, that message is somewhat diluted. But would you, would you say that there's still that sort of message of unity that's going out or has that changed a little bit? Well, now with regard to Afghanistan, this message has been weakened in a way. I, I believe that is true, but in a very predictable manner because Afghanistan from an US perspective is not really seen as a test case for this credibility and for this political will to act uh, on the world stage, um, unfortunately. And this is, um, for us Europeans, not so much a, 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 a problem, so to say, because even from our European perspective, we were not ready to invest too much, to get too much involved uh, in, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan from the very beginning was a US-led mission. And it is till the end, and even for the evacuation mission, it's still up to the US to decide to which extent uh, it will be um, extended, uh, when it will end, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, as I've said, although it's very difficult to say this now with all the drama uh, unfolding in Kabul and in other places in Afghanistan, um, when it comes to the credibility of the West and the unity, the transatlantic unity, um, Afghanistan is too much, I would say, of the past. And um, I still believe that Joe Biden uh, will, will continue to work on this unity, but in a much more focused way. And we Europeans, will be challenged to, or our challenge will be to cooperate with the US administration on certain issues, but the US will also leave us alone with other issues which seem secondary uh, from Washington. 
But from a European perspective, uh, this might be quite different. Take Libya, for example, mm -hmm. or even Ukraine to a certain extent, or the West, uh, the Balkans, definitely. And uh, the challenge is uh, to organize a sort of division of labor between Europe and the US um, when it comes to different crisis zones, uh, crisis area, areas, um, and probably in the European neighborhood will be, we will have to take on more responsibilities. And in the Pacific, it will be uh, much more the US's task, task uh, especially in military terms. Uh, and, and I think that the US government uh, is prepared to work with allies, with European allies in, in this manner. And now the question is, is there still enough attention left for places like Yemen or Afghanistan? Um, you, you, you find in both cases very valuable arguments that this really matters uh, to global security. So in the case of Yemen, you have uh, uh, navigation routes. Um, in the case of Afghanistan, you have uh, raw materials, you have uh, the, the, uh, the neighborhood uh, to, to uh, the neighboring countries like China. Uh, but uh, what, we, uh, what we have to deal with is uh, to uh, f find the right priorities without giving up uh, on, on um, helping people who live under disastrous uh, conditions like in Yemen and maybe, or most probably also in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you're right. There might be some, some sort of changing priorities over time, but this, yeah. uh, your comments just now um, fed into a, a follow-on question that, that I had wanted to ask you about picking up again on your, your article about China, where you talked about the importance of having um, Europe speak with um, a more a coordinated voice um, with a, a single voice. And um, Elizabeth Pond has actually sent in a question that ties in perfectly for where we are in the conversation right now. She writes, what do you think will be the impact of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan on the debate in Germany and France about striving for strategic autonomy and a distancing from US leadership in foreign policy? Do you think that, that this might be a catalyst um, for that debate to, to continue on? It truly is. Um, as I've said, the Afghanistan operation from the very first beginning was an unbalanced mission, so to say, because it was primarily led and also executed by American forces. And many important European nations, NATO uh, partners, uh, unilaterally withdraw, withdrew uh, their troops um, before the end of the mission, after governmental changes in Spain and France, for example, these two major European countries uh, stopped uh, their in engagement in Afghanistan. And so I believe there has never been a plausible opportunity for Europeans to rebalance um, the NATO uh, mission in Afghanistan. So it has always been an American dominated mission. And uh, this, and especially the end of this mission and the way Biden decided uh, how uh, this mission should be terminated, uh, once again, showed us Europeans that we need to strive not for strategic autonomy, but rather for European sovereignty, because some European sovereignty is a much broader concept and not only concentrates on military matters. It's also about trade and industrial policy innovation, also about euro bonds and the financial um, autonomy uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of the European community or European Union. And um, yes, uh, Europe will uh, have to do more. 
And this does not mean that it will uh, distance itself more from the US. I think in many aspects, it will be a, 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 um, an, an addition to uh, what the West can uh, bring about or bring, bring uh, 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 it will be an addition to the West, uh, uh, to, to the weight uh, the West can uh, put uh, on, on, on the stage. Um, in some parts of the world, it will mean and it has already meant that Europe uh, does uh, more on its own. So we have uh, the military mission in, in Mali, which is more or less exclusively, exclusively um, European, but we still need uh, American logistics uh, and surveillance. Uh, so um, European sovereignty does not uh, uh, contradict um, uh, a very close transatlantic friendship. Um, and uh, we sometimes we have to uh, explain this to our French partners. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but uh, well, uh, we'll see in Mali if we can do better. If we Europeans will be able to um, find the right exit uh, strategy, this is a very open question, I must say. And in this case. We cannot um, uh, put the blame on the U.S. It will be ours. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that I think that that's that that comes with taking on more responsibility, right? That yeah. one has to one has to um, address the the one can take credit for the good things that happen, but one also has to to accept uh, when things don't go as well. Yeah, and um, uh, or, and and. To, to end maybe this, uh, this uh, point on, on Afghanistan, um, the, Afghanistan is now the first case, the first example when the US, uh, when the German public, the German government, the German media have to, um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to have this debate. For the first time, we have to take our share of responsibility uh, and the first time we have to talk about the failures of a military mission and um, in, in the case of West Africa this will be even more important and also probably more painful because as I've said um, the blame will be on us uh, and our European partners alone. And indeed, I mean, one sees that debate um, unfolding at the moment. There's been some criticism of the foreign minister, Heiko Maas, um, for Germany's Afghan policy. Of course, the, the foreign office doesn't carry full responsibility for that Afghan policy. But um, there have been calls from other factions in the Bundestag to have more of an explanation about what the policy has been and, and what went wrong. So we, we're seeing this debate that you're describing unfolding um, in the media with um, government officials, with elected officials and, and civil society itself. Um, but I'd like to, to maybe you know, move, move on a little bit and, and pick up on some of your thoughts about European sovereignty um, and this notion of strategic autonomy, which is, which is waning a little bit and sort of shift the conversation to, to the issue that we had intended to talk about today, namely, namely China. And there seems to be um, growing recognition that China is a partner, as well as an economic competitor, as well as a systemic rival. Um, it is all of these things, not just one of these things. And in your, in your piece, um, you argued that the, the corona crisis could actually serve as a catalyst um, for greater US-EU cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China. And so I'd like to ask you to sort of share um, with our viewers today um, how you think a strong Europe can speak with, with one voice um, and how Europe and the US can work more closely together in addressing some of the challenges that are posed by China. So first of all, I want to underline that there's a good news, that, that there's good news, which is that in philosophical terms, the US view on China and the 
EU view on China uh, has been converging. Uh, so you rightly mentioned the, the three dimensions of our relationship with China, uh, competition, systemic rivalry, and cooperation. And um, uh, this was first introduced by the EU Commission. Uh, and now it was more or less taken over by Blinken in his statement about confronting China and cooperating with China and so on. And I believe that this is, uh, this is a very solid um, common ground for us uh, to take on the China challenge. Um, and with the Corona crisis, we've seen uh, how smart, but also how reckless uh, China is exploiting um, uh, mistakes and uh, uh, also maybe um, crisis uh, uh, in, uh, to promote its agenda on the international stage and within uh, international relations uh, between China and other states. Uh, so this uh, created an even more acute sense of urgency for cooperation between the US and um, uh, uh, the European Union. But it also demonstrated to us that the field of um, health, healthcare, of um, developing new medicaments, new vaccines, is also part of the innovation competition going on between um, the West and China and other places in the world. And so I believe that uh, we should expand our transatlantic relationship uh, from the rather traditional issues like trade in manufactured goods and uh, cars and uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, uh, um, um, planes and so on to the uh, high-tech goods and services. Um, and this is um, this kind of MRA technology for vaccines. This is about cybersecurity issues. It's about um, artificial intelligence and guidelines for it. And uh, I think um, the Biden team is quite ready for that. We, we are now seeing the establishment of a US-EU technology council. And um, so uh, all those who are interested in the transatlantic relationship should understand that um, the traditional themes are all right and will be of importance in the future, but we should invest much more in these um, new technology uh, issues. Um, and um, when I went to Congress after <laughs> coming over to Philadelphia, <laughs> meeting you, and uh, when I went to Congress to see some uh, of its members, um, I advocated for very closer, for a much closer look at how international standards for new technologies are set, because this is the big game of the future. Who sets the standards, dominates or defines the market? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was already the wisdom of Werner von Siemens, the founder of Siemens uh, company. And uh, I believe for many years, uh, Western countries, especially Germany, by the way, uh, let the innovation, uh, let the standard setting um, mechanisms, um, and now the Chinese try to build up influence there. And we have also to bring in our partners in other continents. So I guess Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are regarded as very close partners by the US as well, to a certain extent. But if you look at their voting behavior in international standard setting um, organizations, they mostly align with the techno authoritarian ideology of China. So there's a lot to do in terms of coalition building and of uh, trying to put the frame, framework right uh, for new technologies. Um, 
geopolitics of emerging technologies. This is a major topic for our transatlantic relationship. Thank you. I think that's a great way of, of sort of setting, setting the stage and, and providing um, a, a forward-looking view on things. Um, one of the, the points that you made in your piece that I thought was particularly interesting that, that ties in here was you were saying that the, that the goal has to be to promote a kind of interdependence in which there's mutual dependence that also gives rise to common interests. And you've talked about what some of those common interests are and sort of charted a path forward when it comes to agenda setting um, and standard setting as a way that, that the US and Europe can, can work more closely together. Um, but China also has to be part of those conversations. So how do you see that sort of triangle um, working in the, in the years to come? Uh, first of all, I hope that on many uh, topics, there will be a common ground, a consensus, a, a common framework defined by the US and the EU. In many fields of technology, of economic activity, this is uh, the, uh, the, the, the competence of the EU, not of single uh, EU member states. And uh, once we have defined common rules for artificial intelligence, for example, we can enter um, negotiations or talks with China in a much more, in a much stronger way. And uh, I think the, that uh, Biden's agenda on uh, consumer uh, protection, on data privacy, on uh, antitrust policy uh, gives us a huge opportunities to come closer together in terms of regulating new technologies and new markets. And this might be really interesting when it comes to uh, uh, negotiating global rules uh, with uh, partners. In this case, China should be a partner uh, um, with partners like China. And the same is true for climate protection. So both on both sides of the Atlantic, we believe that we need China as a partner for protecting our climate. And, mm -hmm. uh, but this will be much easier to be implemented um, if um, on both sides of the Atlantic, we uh, put the same emphasis on renewable energies, on um, reducing uh, fossil energy sources and so on. And there's even, there might be even some, some space for uh, finding a common carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, so an uh, 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 last example is um, due diligence uh, uh, of supply chain uh, is human rights, um, even human rights uh, sanctions me mechanisms, um, not only with regard to China, but also with other uh, violators, violators uh, of human rights. I think that once we have uh, found a common ground, but also a, a common uh, common rules on on that, we'll, we will be much more effective in maintaining uh, and maybe even uh, expanding expanding the the rules space order. So, to me, we it seems that. A, a consensus on both sides of the Atlantic is a precondition for tackling broader issues and engaging with China. Thank you, Niels. Uh, I, I'd now like to invite one of our viewers, uh, one of our members here in New York, Tara Hariharan, to ask her question. Um, she raised her hand in the chat and I've uh, allowed her to talk. Thank you so much, Steve, for the opportunity. And uh, Niels, thank you so much. This was uh, an excellent and very detailed overview of where uh, the uh, Europeans and the US can uh, can cooperate um, in, in dealing with China. But I, I also wanted to uh, you know delve further into areas where uh, Europe and the US may not be uh, very much yet completely on the same page. 
Um, for instance, there is, I think, the fact that uh, Europe is still divided within itself about how much um, uh, to address uh, uh, China regarding the human rights space, because on one hand, we are seeing that the European Parliament has taken a strong stance and is even um, you know, holding up the passage of the European uh, CAI, the, the uh, a Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, because uh, they are concerned about human rights issues in China. Whereas I, I'm not sure that all of Europe is completely on board with the, the belief that Europe should be as uh, hawkish um, regarding human rights issues as, as the US has and the Biden administration has now become. Um, so how do you see this uh, comprehensive agreement on investment developing, if at all? And um, do, you, do you see Europe becoming as um, fervently supporting the causes of human rights as the U.S. is right now uh, in the case of China? You're right. Um, there is not automatically a consensus on human rights issues with regard to China. This has a lot to do with domestic policy developments in some of the EU member states, which have turned more authoritarian. But it has also much to do with mistakes made in the past by the European Union when it comes to European solidarity and financial aid to uh, countries suffering under uh, uh, dramatic economic crisis like Greece, uh, Portugal, uh, and to a certain degree, uh, Italy. But I must say that in the last 12 months or so, we've seen many EU member states, especially smaller member states, taking a stronger stance on China and standing up to a certain degree against China. Uh, we have seen Lithuania, we've seen the Czech Republic, uh, this uh, is very interesting because they have somehow woken up to, and they have understood that this is a broader challenge. It's not only about trade. And I think that the German debate helped uh, because um, over the last four years in Germany, the discourse over China and the narrative on China has changed tremendously. Um, especially uh, through the efforts of parliamentarians uh, across party lines, I must say. And so I'm, I'm rather confident, confident about uh, the European Union taking a maybe a harder line or a, 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 at least a united line uh, when it comes to China. This depends uh, on uh, Germany taking the lead and offering and advocating a uh, more European or a European China policy and not only um, uh, thinking about its own uh, China policy, but it also to a large extent depends on Chinese behavior. So uh, chi uh, Chinese uh, wolf diplomacy, some rather aggressive remarks coming out of uh, the Chinese government have also raise some skepticism uh, about uh, how China behaves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, smaller states in Europe. Uh, so I think the time is not so bad uh, to, uh, to have a, a more unified um, uh, front of the US and EU when it comes to China. Uh, as far as the uh, trade agreement is concerned, I think there was some willingness and some readiness on the European side uh, to sign another trade agreement, even uh, if it is not uh, fully reciprocal in terms of market access. Uh, but the harsh Chinese reaction by sanctioning parliamentarians has undercut this agreement completely. So, um, Chinese sanctions targeted the heart of democracy in Europe. And I'm not sure if they really had thought about it before. If they wanted to do that, then it's fine. They got what they wanted. 
um, uh, um, uh, harsh uh, reactions from the European Parliament and from national parliaments, uh, but they uh, more or less sunk uh, the, the trade agreement because no European parliamentarian will accept that uh, democratically elected um, representatives of uh, Europe or of any European nation are sanctioned uh, this way. Thank you, Niels. Thank you for that. Um, as our time together starts to come to an end, let me um, sort of try to weave these, these two threads of our conversation together, the, the conversation about Afghanistan and the conversation about China. Um, because of course, one of the things that people are watching is what will happen next in Afghanistan. There are concerns about a vacuum that's been created and who might step into that vacuum. Um, you mentioned Russia and China a little bit earlier in our conversation. And certainly one country um, that seems to have great interest in Afghanistan is China because of the natural resources that are there. Um, do you think that, that China will work with the Taliban to try to exert influence there? Yes, of course, because it's, it's a neighboring uh, country. But in terms of vacuum and of who fills the vacuum and who will uh, gain from uh, the Western retreat from Afghanistan, I think we have to make the distinction uh, between the security dimension and the economic dimension. In terms of hard security, I do, know, I do not see any great power being willing uh, to interfere uh, directly uh, with military means in Afghanistan. So we will not see retreat of uh, American forces and incoming uh, Russian or Chinese forces, mm -hmm. uh, that's for sure. Um, in, in security terms, as I've already mentioned, I rather uh, expect and fear a return to a civil war-like situation uh, with involvement from direct neighbors. So it, it will be a more, more of a regional conflict, so to say. You will see Iranian influence because of the Shia. You will see Pakistani influence for, for evident reasons. Maybe others also joining some uh, some uh, uh, regional powers, uh, regional states trying to find some proxy uh, weapons delivery, maybe from all of them. Uh, but in terms of security, this will be a rather complicated si uh, situation. In terms of e economic influence, of course, China wants to add Afghanistan to the list of their uh, uh, Silk Road uh, um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, in terms of infrastructure and uh, trade routes, this is not really necessary and it's an, uh, a difficult country uh, for, uh, for transport, for geographic, geographic and uh, topographic uh, reasons. And they have already the uh, Guada or the Chinese Pakistan economic corridor, uh, and so for that for this corridor, they do not really need uh, uh, Afghanistan. But in terms of raw material, uh, this is much more interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of of the uh, powers, especially Russia and China, will try to find uh, some uh, some um, uh, some raw materials uh, there. But China always waits for stability to come in. And that's why they are eager to um, work together with the Taliban because they do not care for human rights and for, for the uh, domestic uh, constitution system of, of any country. They just want to have a stable uh, framework, a secure uh, environment for their investment activities and their economic activities. And Maybe this should also give us some hope because this might help to create an international environment which might oblige the Taliban to compromise with internal competitors, non-Taliban parts of, uh, Afghan, of the Afghan society. 
-hmm. And we still hope, and there's much diplomatic effort deployed by the German government, uh, we still hope uh, for the Doha round of negotiations to, uh, to find a peaceful solution to this conflict and to, to find a, a constitution which might enable most of the Afghan people to live somehow together. This might not fulfill our hopes and our promises, but still it might end uh, or might avoid, uh, avoid uh, another civil war. This is not so likely, uh, but I think in terms of international diplomacy, we need a co coordinated uh, effort to have a sort of regional peace framework, a sort of Af Afghan, Afghanistan peace group uh, that works on that. Um, otherwise, um, Chinese investment will not uh, flow in so easily. Um, in, this, in a civil war uh, torn country, you cannot really invest. Mm -hmm. So, Niels, I'd like to close with a, a viewer question that was just submitted to the chat. Um, one of our viewers writes, after what has happened this past week as a NATO member state, does Germany still think that the United States is a reliable partner that is committed to multilateralism? Yes, yes, 100%. I think that we should not um, derive too much um, uh, uh, from, from the situation in Afghanistan. It's, it's, it, it was poorly conducted. It, it's, it's tragic. It's terrible. And we have to correct as much as we can do. Uh, um, on the ground there by taking in uh, as many Afghan people as possible in the US as well as in Europe. But still, um, I do not like this idea of that this is a complete failure in terms of overall credibility or even in terms of NATO um, cohesion. No, uh, I think uh, Trump's presidency was much more uh, damaging uh, to the credibility of NATO uh, than uh, with regard to NATO member states, of course, um, um, than, than what we've seen in Afghanistan. Well, Niels, um, I'd like to thank you for speaking with, with us today, not about one complex issue, but about two complex issues and how they tie together and about the transatlantic relationship um, overall. This has been a, a very thoughtful and very thought-provoking conversation. And so I'd like to thank you again for, for taking the time. Um, I wish you a, a good weekend and our viewers a good weekend as well. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Stephen.